Good morning. My name is Nancy Terrian. I'm the president of Grafton Historical Society. I have to say I love my job. I hope you can come and visit me here at the museum. We're at 71 Main Street, South Grafton, and Google should know where we are by now. <laughs> hope you have a wonderful experience coming and joining in all the fun that we have. Thank you. This is a model of the Center of Grafton from 1887. And uh, the reason I like to start with this is because it shows the two major shoe uh, manufacturing companies that were here in Grafton, making Grafton the second largest shoe manufacturing city in Worcester County. And so we had uh, Forbish and Brown right over where the library is right now. And we had Gibbs and Allen where the railroad tracks go through to Upton. And this was our little railroad station right here that was said to have brought bring um, 100 people a day to Grafton Center, most likely to work in the shoe industries. We also had a leather currying factory. This large factory here with the two buildings was leather currying. That actually started in 1840. And I'm sure it was because leather was so valuable in belts and boots, uh, even books back then. These little houses on North Street, and some of the houses on South Street were also uh, part of the shoe manufacturing companies. Some of them did do a full product from start to finish. Others just cut the leather uppers or they stitched the leather uppers together. Um, some of them even did uh, produce a blackening agent that was put on the leather to protect it. So this is the first shoe that was made in Grafton called the Brogan. The interesting part about this shoe is there's no right or left cut out for your foot. Um, so it was most likely uncomfortable to start with, but it was better than going barefoot. And so the reason Grafton became the second largest uh, shoe manufacturing company is because they were able to ship those shoes to the Southern states and they would come back with leather and molasses and other um, things that were of value. So you notice that the Civil War statue is there, but Mr. Jerome Wheelock's statue is missing. Mr. Jerome Wheelock was still busy making money at that time. Um, he had invented something for the steam engine valve that improved it tremendously. And so when he died, he made sure that there was a statue put in Grafton. There's supposed to be two other statues, one at Clark University and one at the Worcester Railroad Station. So these, on this side, you can see some additional shoes. Right here, we have some additional shoes that were um, produced in Grafton. As time went by, people had more leisure time and they had uh, jobs in, in just, instead of farming, they had jobs in um, industry and of course, uh, businesses like banking and um, retail outlets. So they would need a, a better dress shoe. So the Forbish and Brown Shoe Company besides being in Grafton, actually bought out Mr. Jasper Nelson's shoe business that was set up in North Grafton. And later on in this interview, I'll show you a map of that building. Over here, we have a, a case of vans. And uh, in the 1800s, it was, there was still a lot of modesty and people did not want their young folks to be having personal conversations. So they came up with the language of the fans, which you can see right here. If you rested the fan on your right cheek, it meant yes. If you left, put it on your left cheek, it meant no. If you held the handle to your lips, it meant kiss me. We can go on to the airport. 
me when I set up. Um, Grafton's Airport only ran for about 25 years, but it was very uh, popular. When they had the grand opening for October 8th, 1927, we have some photographs over here that show how many people came. It was the first time in this area that people got to see those small planes up close and to actually get a chance to ride on one for $5. The crowds uh, reached about three to 4,000 and they had to have 200 police do detail for that, those, that weekend. You can see over here, we have a picture of Charles Lindbergh and that is because Mr. Lindbergh landed at our airport twice. He landed the first time to meet with of Robert Goddard of the aerospace technology, and the second time just to refuel his plane. We also had a B-17 bomber land over there. And in order to find out the details of that, I'm gonna ask you to come to the museum and we'll give you the full tour. You can see we have a propeller here. Our airstrip, like all the others, including Boston, started out as a muddy field. And so you could oftentimes have a plane that crash landed or even crashed on takeoff. And so this comes from an ox, uh, Curtis Ox, and um, that was one of the ones that did have a crash landing over there. We have so many notebooks on all subjects lots about the airport. And we also found out that there was a problem in our notebooks. We have all kinds of lawsuits drawn by Mr. Harry Worcester Smith, who had a mansion up on Lordville Boulevard, which what we know is Brigham Hill Road that starts at North Brigham Hill Road intersection and goes down to Wyman and Gardens. So Mr. Harry Worcester Smith was a little bit of a rascal and he got kicked out of WPI for riding Mr. Higgins' horse through the chapel on the third floor. So they did ask him to leave, but he went on to get a good education and he married one of the most prominent women in Worcester, the Crompton woman. And he was actually instrumental in joining Crompton and those companies together. Again, Mr. Smith has a very long story, so I'm not gonna get into all the details today, but come to the museum. You'll find out so much about Mr. Harry Worcester Smith. You'll wanna find out where his mansion was and where his golf course was. It was actually technically not on Grafton property, but it abutted his Grafton property. So you can come see those photos. <laughs> this is a lovely piece of furniture made by one of our Grafton residents, Mr. Levi Leland. And he also made some others. We have so many interesting things. In every <laughs> nook and cranny, we have something. We have this um, rudder from the Blackstone Valley Canal boats that went up and down the canal bringing uh, mostly textiles, but they did also have some a time where they brought passengers. So. And we have so many maps. I will show you. I will show you the map um, from North Grafton, and I'm hoping that there's not going to be too much reflection on that. Down in the lower left-hand corner, you're going to see the Nelson Shoe Manufacturing Company. And right above that is the picture of the lovely mansion that was there. This whole area here was Nelson property. And right now, 140 travels this way comes a little bit to the left of the Nelson property, doesn't go straight through like it used to. 
the Nelson Mansion had some beautiful gardens where they would have gatherings. Again, um, in those days, people had a little bit more leisure time and they would also gather uh, for parties out in their gardens if they could. The other thing that this map shows is Washington Mills, which is still there. And then you can see that this part of Washington Mills that we know now was a large uh, flex producing mill called Flinson and Boyson. And uh, flex was used in everything, uh, shoes, book bindings. Uh, there were so many uses for flax that this was a large producer of flax thread. Uh, you'll also see in this map that there was a hotel over here. And I always wondered what this was when I first saw it, but it is a water tower producing water for the area over there where the hotel was. So, maps are our specialty. We have beautiful, beautiful maps. Again, you have to come by the museum. Here's something that is probably the oldest piece in the museum, is this piece of fabric. So this said that Sarah Sartell Prentice uh, wore this. So Sarah Sartell was uh, the wife of our first minister here in Grafton, Solomon Prentice. And this lovely piece of fabric probably was woven in the 1600s. And it belonged to Sarah's aunt over in England. And when she heard Sarah was getting married, she shipped it over to the United States for her. So um, that is a beautiful piece. This is an interesting um, display for the wooden water pipes. Uh, there are still wooden water pipes that are working in Boston and some of the surrounding cities. If the water pipe is buried at the right level and it has water continuing to flow through it, they'll last forever. <clears throat> so when I first came into my position, I said to my husband, what would this item be? And his reply was, just think of it as a giant pencil sharpener because you, it's hard to see right now, but it uh, shaved off the ends of that wooden pipe so that they could be joined together. And these are all some of the tools that would be used, the augers and the planes. Um, they were quite inventive, actually, back then. But I'm sure they got tired of getting water in buckets by the well. And we have uh, article over here that was written. Um, let me <laughs> let me have a minute. Okay. okay. So this article, um, this article is about um, William Howard Taft, who was turned out to be our president. But this was when he was a young child, probably about eight or nine. He was playing with the Fisk children as Mr. Fisk was installing some wooden water pipes. Most likely not in Grafton, because the uh, wooden water pipe probably was installed in Millbury on that day. But um, Mr. William Howard Taft was playing with the Fisk children. And they played with the wooden chips that came off of the water pipe. Everyone loves to hear stories about survivors. Unfortunately, this story has more to do with the soldiers that gave their life. This plaque was given to the town of Grafton by the DAR, Daughters of American Revolution. And the reason they gave mostly all the towns around here was to commemorate the men that passed during the Revolutionary War. We have a picture of the plaque on the tree, on the oak tree that was on Oak Street uh, in Grafton Center. And it was said to have been at the tavern, which is where the men got their daily news. 
And when the Revolutionary War broke out, they had a call to arms and they chose one in seven men. And then the war continued, so they had another call to arms when they chose uh, one in five men. And so in order to honor those people that went off and never came back, they, we had the plaque given to us. In 1938, however, the plaque went missing. And the reason being was the hurricane came through Grafton, knocked down the tree. So until 2017, there was no sign of where the plaque was. Till one day we went to the library and they said, we have this big heavy plaque in our basement and we don't know where it belongs. So the mystery got solved. We were able to get the plaque from the library and display it at the museum. This lovely wedding dress was worn by Sally Brown, who married our one of our most prominent men in town, uh, Jonathan Warren, who owned one graft in common. This dress was imported from Europe, um, and she wore this in 1823 when she got married to Jonathan Warren. We have another wedding dress over here that is pink. Um, I'm gonna show you some other wedding dresses that are not white. They're uh, printed. We even have a chocolate brown wedding dress in our collection that you can see on our website if you visit 2017 History in Bloom. You'll see that chocolate brown wedding dress and a variety of nice wedding dresses. I think there's 16. There's beautiful detail on that. There is. There is. Now, in this case, we have a sample of flax um, bundled handkerchiefs, they're called. The woman who made these lovely bundled handkerchiefs grew the flax, she tamped it down to get the threads, she dyed it, and then she wove that into a, what they call a bundled handkerchief. When they went someplace, instead of having a purse, they had this handkerchief that they would put their belongings in. It would be much like we know as a humble sack, but that was what they had back then. We have another lovely piece that is from the 1700s. This would have been used uh, when they ground their cornmeal, which was a staple of the day to make Johnny cakes or cornbread. And when you come to the museum, I'll show you what this does. Um, it, you'll be surprised. I'm not gonna share that secret today. <laughs> this is the wedding dress that I was telling you about that is a printed fabric. This is from 1788. Um, it was worn by uh, Betty Brown Cutler, and uh, she did ask her aunt to make a quilt out of it. So in 1817, um, her aunt, Elizabeth Cutler Travis, presented her with this lovely quilt here. We do have other samples of lovely quilts, but we also have these wonderful models of the textile mills. This was the earliest um, textile mill called Boscanut Mill. All these mills pretty much changed hands quite frequently. And this one started out making woolen products back at the time that they started. Women were still cooking over an open fire sometimes. And the wood, the wool, would not catch on fire and as cotton would. This is the Saunders Mill. 
and we have a lovely picture here of the Saunders Mansion. It sits very quietly on Main Street. People pass it every day, and they don't realize that that was a mansion and had the mill attached to it. This mill um, tried, as with all of them, they tried everything possible to stay afloat and to be financially solvent. At one point, they even had chickens in there to try to make money, but eventually they had to give in and tear the mill down. Unfortunately, those beautiful granite blocks were used for Phil in the Worcester Center when they built that many, many years ago. And our loveliest of all, I think, mills is the Fisherville Mill. On the right-hand side, you'll see that the, that's the Fisher Mansion. Surprisingly, that is the house next door that sort of resembles it, but not exactly, because our property is on the spot where the barn and the lovely driveway was, and the gardens, I'm sure. This Fisherville Mill stayed in business the longest. <clears throat> it, when, in 1999, there was a fire that burned it to the ground. But at that time, they were making lawn chairs. Up until that time, they were still trying to survive with some fabric um, making. This was from World War II, and this fabric was used in the Pacific Theater for mosquito nettings. And we have another piece of fabric that was from World War II that has a very interesting story. This, of course, was used for parachute material. And here at the museum, we had a wonderful um, woman who came in as a volunteer who grew up in France. She recognized the parachute material as material that her grandmother had made her wedding gown out of. Like many in that era, there was very little nice fabric and people were still getting married during the war. So they would go into the fields or the forests and find the parachute material and make their wedding dress out of that. So over here, we have a lot of um, books. These are my favorite. That is the historic inventory. And it tells all about the houses and the history behind the homes here in Grafton. Not everything is covered, uh, of course, but mostly all the historic homes are definitely covered. Yeah, it's nice to poke around and find out the history of those homes. This is another interesting story with the $10,000 reward poster. I'm not sure if you can get that without glare. So there was a bank in One Graft in Common and it was five men that decided they could use the money out of the bank. So they produced a plan and right in the middle of the day, somehow they went in and they were able to take $180,000 from the bank. It was um, in bonds and cash and they shipped it off to New York. Three of them got charged with the crime only the other two they couldn't pin the crime on them. But $10,000 back in 1870 was a monumental uh, reward. And the money that they had in the bank was quite high as well. So This is one of my favorite things in the museum. This is from the Grand Army of the Republic. And we were just doing research on this man, Mr. Champney. He actually was a prisoner of war for the Civil War. And he ended up in Andersonville Prison. Someone was generous enough to give us his diary. So we have the whole diary that's been transcribed telling his woes and how hard it was to try to survive and have hope for the next day that he might get released. 
Unfortunately, he did pass, and his remains, though, were moved to Grafton. So he does have a tombstone here in our town. So we're happy to have him back. But there's so many soldiers in here that tells where they signed up, where they served, whether they were incarcerated, whether they were injured. Um, most of these men were able to come back, but um, this is post-24 was the way that the men that did come back from the war could gather, share their stories, and be companions. Um, let's do this and then uh, do a few more things. This lovely piece was done by a girl who was 14 at the time. I believe she finished it at 15. This piece was done by Betsy Woods and you can see how ornate it was. She did all the embroidery and the painting, all done on silk uh, to depict her father's passing. Mr. Wood was the original owner and builder of the Grafton Inn. And after his passing, his son took over the inn for a while. So. So we have some interesting pieces in um, carriages. This one uh, was covered with a gingham fabric when it was in our storage area in the center. When I uncovered it, I found this beautiful fabric. It has got to be the original fabric that it was covered with. And the other interesting thing is this quilt. Um, in the Depression days, they realized that people were using the sacks that the grain came in to make clothing. So they started printing a design on the sack so they could use it uh, for something special and have a nice looking garment. Of course, once the garment started to wear out, they would cut up the pieces and make a quilt. It was always repurposed, just like everything else. Even her wedding gown that I talked about earlier, a um, friend from France, when she found out that her grandmother's wedding gown had the potential of being woven right here in Grafton where she ended up living, she called her mother and she said, do we still have that wedding gown fabric? And her mother said, of course not. It was repurposed into something else. So. That's what happens when you're on a budget and you want to make sure that you're thrifty enough and today's day and age, they're doing the same thing, saving the planet by reusing things. It's a wonderful thing. This story about Mr. George Jordan um, always makes me laugh because he was well known. He was a very generous man. He did so much for the community. During World War II, he even used his school buses as ambulances uh, if the men that were wounded needed to be transported someplace. They didn't have transportation. He would offer to use his school buses as transportation. But he uh, sold Ford vehicles for quite a while until the day that he decided that um, Ford was putting too much pressure on him to get a larger facility. He had liked the facility where he was, so he turned them down. And so they said, you can no longer be a Ford dealership. So what did he do? He took the D off of his sign, and instead of Ford, a Jordan's Fords, he just had Jordan for service instead of the D. Very much of a Yankee ingenuity person.
This cabinet is just full to the brim with all kinds of interesting things. On the top are the two original Valentines that we believe were probably the first Valentines ever made in the United States. Uh, Mr. Jotham Taft was a married man and he and his wife had just lost one of their twin sons and he thought it might cheer his wife up to accompany him on his job searching for stationary products for the company that he worked for. They went off to Europe and they saw the Valentine. When they came back, they decided that that process could be done right here in their home. So they started making Valentines, but instead of signing them, they just put some simple initials their parents were Quakers, and it was against the Quaker religion to have something so fancy as that. So they um, never got credit for it. But they did, the business did grow, and they actually employed Esther Howland, who went on to, uh, in her shop in Worcester and made Valentine's. Um, and she got the credit for having the first Valentines because she mass produced them. She had the financing of her father. If you uh, go on to the Worcester website for the Historical Society, way at the very bottom, you'll see a little sentence that says, the uh, first Valentines though were probably made in Grafton. And of course, we know that they were, but they just couldn't get the credit for them. So we have other lovely things in here. Uh, Mr. Warren's wedding vest. So many interesting things um, that you'll have to come and stop by the museum and see them all. Now, many of you have a jack in your car in case you have a flat tire. I have one. I've actually tried to use it very unsuccessfully, and somebody came to my rescue, thank goodness. Um, this is a jack for a wagon wheel. I'm not sure whether they carried it in the wagon, or I imagine they must have. But those bumpy roads would be tough on those wagon wheels. And I always like to quiz people on this piece in the museum. I'm gonna show you that it does spin, it has a little receptacle here, and over here it has some teeth that look a little bit like a saw or almost like a chainsaw. So that is a pencil sharpener. It's quite heavy. I'm sure that not many families had that. It's rather special, actually. lots of um, things that would entertain the family, especially the children. And uh, over here, we have a nice memory wall of our, some of our military men that served. Down on the ground near the hearth, we have some foot warmers. And people have to remember that there was no central heat and no electricity. So if you wanted to have your feet warm when you stepped away from the fire, you would have to put coals in the foot warmer. And the bed warmer came in handy as well. This foot warmer is quite special. This one did not come from Grafton. That was a gift from our friend Corinne, who grew up in France. When she saw our Foot warmer when she started working at the museum for us. She said, again, I have a foot warmer at home that belonged to my grandmother. 
So the countries were very much alike. Every country uh, back in the early 1800s, they didn't have the central heat, so they had to do the best they could. Um, so Miss Corinne gave us her foot warmer as a gift. This man here, Mr. Sampson, Joseph Sampson, he went off to prepare for war at Fort Devens. But unfortunately, his timing was horrible. He was there during the 1917 pandemic, and that pandemic was even worse than the one that we just went through. So Mr. Sampson did not make it. He passed away. They have a nice memorial to him down here, not far from the museum, at Sampson Square. And the soldiers uh, um, go there for Memorial Day every year. This is a wonderful Victrola. Um, it does still work. I'll play a little bit for you. So, no electricity. Remember, you have to wind this up to get some power behind it. Then there's a lever on this to get the turntable going. And you have to place a needle on it. So, now, we love to share this with the children, that this is the way you do volume control. <laughs> so, again, one way to entertain, have entertainment, and the table that it's on is a lovely piece from the Nelson Mansion. Gitsy. Um, even though people had to be frugal, they would save their monies and they would indulge in fine china or uh, things, beautiful um, dresses and textile products. That was what made them enjoy their time. And of course, the other thing is sharing with family and friends, just like we do. Thank you for coming to the museum.